Hey, this is Sam from Real Crafter, and today we have the pleasure of chatting with composer Gareth Coker. He is a BAFTA-nominated composer, most known for his work on Ori and the Blind Forest and the sequel, Ori and the Will of the Wisps, as well as a whole bunch of short films and other stuff we will talk about. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Great to be here. Um, Longtime fan of you. Uh, oh, jeez. Yeah, sorry. I'm going to embarrass you now, but uh, Mass Effect is my favorite trilogy of all time, so... It's actually my favorite game series of all time, probably. So thanks. Uh, great to. We've never met in person, but uh, I was yes. going to say, how is this possible? Yeah, because I'm always at GDC, and I feel like there's been there would have been so many occasions where we'd have been in the same room, but well, our paths have never crossed. <laughs> yeah. When was your first game developers conference? 2014. That's that's hilarious. I think that's like around the time I stopped going. Okay. Okay. Well, that that would explain it then. So yeah, I started in like 2005 or six, and went almost every year uh, and then kind of slowed down around then. So yeah, we just missed each other, unfortunately. Yes. But here we are now. We have a half an hour or so. Yep. I'll get to know plenty about Gareth Coker. Um, so I'm going to start sort of at the beginning uh, and ask about the Royal Academy of Music. And I guess how you got into music in the first place, was it inspired by you know family or just inspired within? Uh, did you have any experience with music before you went to school? So I'll rewind back to the age. To, I turned eight. And my parents got my piano lessons for my birthday. And I was like, I don't want that. I just wanted Lego or something, right? And then three months later, they sent me to boarding school. Now, just for some context for American viewers, boarding school in England is not like some hellish purgatory that a problem child gets sent to. They're actually just pretty good schools in England. And they are specifically also for parents who live abroad, like British parents who live abroad, which we did at the time. And they, my parents were living in Holland and East Coast America, but they wanted me to have an English education. Now, in boarding school, you're there for like 36 weeks of the year, and you're there at the weekends too, and there's just not much to do at the weekend, so I was like, I'm going to kill the time by practicing the piano. And, you know, when you're 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and you practice something, and you practice properly, uh, you get pretty good pretty quick. It's just, it's just what happens. Then I got put into choir, I got put into jazz band, I got put into orchestra. I also started learning the trumpet and trombone because I, I picked up the music bug pretty quick because I was doing it all the time. And it was in jazz band that the teacher was like, uh, yeah, we need someone to improvise. And I didn't even know what it meant, but I could read the chord symbols at that point and I would just start improvising. And that's kind of where the composing started. From jazz band improvising, it went to noodling around on the piano, just coming up with various piano melodies and, and, and things like that. And then one day, uh, the head of music at the boarding school was like, uh, you should apply to music school for composition, just based on what he'd heard while I was in the practice rooms. And I put together a portfolio, and it's literally just a portfolio of piano tracks and one terrible string quartet. And they accepted me. And the I, I asked, like, on my first day there, I asked, like, the, the head of the program, like, why did you pick me? And he was like, well, you, you can't orchestrate. You can't really arrange very well. You don't really know much about the instruments. Uh, you can't conduct. Your music tech skills are non-existent. Like listing all the things I couldn't do. Wow. But then he was like, you can write a melody. And that's the hardest thing for us to teach. We can teach you all the rest. That's true. That literally was the only reason why they chose me is because uh, like I could write a tune. Like I remember being at the auditions and there were all of these other students with like the most elaborate score books, like super professionally produced. And I'm there with like my scribbles and everything. Um, but it's not they, what they were looking for. They were looking for someone who could they, they could actually work with and kind of sculpt that wasn't the you know finished article. Not just me, the other students as well. So at that point, I was like, I'm okay. I'm going to start taking this seriously. However. Um, if you look through my career history, you'll see this gap where I spent three years in Japan. So I finished the Royal Academy of Music. I kind of sailed through the program. Um, the great thing about the Academy is you get all of the technical knowledge, orchestration, conducting, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't get, I, I have no hesitation saying this publicly, uh, you don't get enough real life, or at least at the time, you didn't get enough like real life experience. Um, I was going to ask you actually, like, it did, it, was it like a scoring for media? Did they teach you any of that sort of? It was purely music. It, it was, but it was it was pretty loose. I would say there were, there was plenty of like media esque assignments, but I would say it wasn't really rooted in what modern scoring is now. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, but I did get all of the technical knowledge I you could ever possibly need and and forget. Um, uh, so at twenty two, it's like I'm like no one's going to hire me to do anything musically, and I, I, frankly, I just wasn't ready. 
And I remember being up late at night on Google and like jobs for recent graduates. And I, I've discovered the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program. And so I went and taught English for three years. And people asked me, why did you go and do that? It has nothing to do with music, but actually it has everything to do with my music career. Um, because how I talk to people, how I conduct myself is all purely based on my time in Japan. If you're familiar at all with Japanese culture, it's all about working for the benefit of the group, which has huge parallels with what we do in game, film, and television. Much as people like to put the composer in the ivory tower, it's not the case at all. It's like we are part of a team and we're trying to come together to make something special. And that's, that is like the centerpiece of Japanese culture. And I think the biggest benefit of being there was it stripped me, not of all ego, but certainly a large amount of it uh, because they did not care about my music. I was there to teach English and be do my best for the school. So it kind of like just got me in the mindset of like being part of a team uh, in order to do my best work for the, the students that I was teaching. Um, in my final year of Japan, I was like, I'd started getting the music bug back and then I applied to the University of Southern California, which is like super professionally focused. It's it's I, like the, the piece of paper you get at the end of it is largely meaningless, sorry USC, but the best thing about it is that you're gonna be ready after you finish that course because it's just relentless assignment after assignment after assignment. And that is the reality of especially how your first few years in the business are going to be. You're just trying to do as many jobs as you can to stay afloat until you hit something that really like takes off. Yeah. So by, by the time you got to USC, it was less about music knowledge, more about like just the hustle and the business yes, side of things and exactly. working on actual films for real. Yes. And actually it, it, it seems like Japan kind of gave you a shortcut because a lot of us, our egos are eventually smashed down to bits at some point <laughs> in our career. Right, you just got it out of the way, so. And, and I mean, the other benefit is being able to see a part of the world and have access, not just to Japan, but the rest of Asia at a much cheaper cost because traveling from Japan to Korea, to China, to, to wherever else, it's much cheaper doing it from Japan than flying from England every time, right? That's like a two hour flight versus a 12 hour flight. Um, so yeah. I, I really got to see a lot of, you know, a part of the world which I might not have previously visited. Um, and I do, you know, I'm always harping on to composers that are, getting started it's like you, you've got to get out of out of the academic stuff as soon as possible there's nothing wrong with it i just don't think you can write really great music if you haven't experienced real life i agree it just depends on what your definition of what real life is you know it could be going to a bunch of museums it could be visiting a bunch of different countries it's just you know i, I might i might be biased i uh, i didn't attend music school at all i have no musical training so well and that's the other thing i point out like danny elfman Hans zimmer they didn't go to music school they seem to be doing okay right like yeah, you know. i think so Last I checked. <laughs> so I guess segueing into your career, um, it looks like you started out scoring quite a few short films, as a lot of people do, and kind of build their way up. And then in, was it 2015, there was a sudden shift. You worked on your first game. How did you make that change? Like what got you into video games? Well, it's funny because I'd always wanted to work in video games, but it was just about, you know, finding the right ends. So while I was doing all these short films and, you know, what isn't listed in my credits, I did a ton of production music. And I found production music very useful, just library music for, for various companies. Um, just getting into the habit of finishing stuff quickly and to, to spec. Um, it's a great habit of, like, you know, how to be professional. All at the same time, though, I was pretty active on various, like, gaming websites where people were making games for free. Um, ModDB is is where the director of Ori found me. Oh, interesting. And the track that he listened to on my profile that was like, yep, he'll be a great fit for Ori, uh, was a track from a student film that I did while I was at USC. Um, so I literally posted the track on there because I thought it was quite good. And it's very simple. It's, bas it's basically just like two or, two or three instruments and a very simple melody, but it's very foresty. And then Thomas was like, Thomas, Thomas Marler, the director of the studio, he was like, if you score our prototype for free we'll pitch it to various uh various publishers and if a publisher accepts and gives us a deal you can score the game and you'll get paid so that happened in 2012 so i knew at 2012 that i was working on something you know that was was pretty good i'm a gamer like first and foremost and i think when you've played enough games you kind of you kind of know when you're working on something that feels like it's going to be, that it has a chance of being good. Obviously, you know, there's a lot of variables along the way, like 
that need to happen to stick the landing. Right. But you know, when you pick up a prototype, you just know if it's if it feels good to play. It's it's like that first ten minutes when you start a game, you kind of know if you're going to enjoy it or not. If the controls yeah. feel good, if your hand is being held just enough, like so that you can get into the game. Uh, and this was that. Like I could pick it up, and I wasn't great at platforming games at the time, and I could just pick it up, and I'm like, I just felt it. And uh, yeah, for the next for the next three years, I <laughs> I put together a score. They gave they gave me a budget albeit not the biggest one but like they gave me a budget that was enough to record with a with a small orchestra for the game which is frankly insane because i'd never done anything like that before but they they gave me everything i need uh, yeah and that's not bad for a first game exactly that's a that's a good deal yeah it w- it obviously worked out extremely well better than any of us could have imagined um interestingly like at the time, Xbox was going through like a bunch of changes. They hadn't had the greatest of launches with the Xbox One. And originally, Ori was going to be an Xbox 360 game only. But then Phil Spencer came in and just reviewed the entire portfolio and was like, why is this on the 360 only? I'm not sure if that's exactly how it went down. But all of a sudden, we were like front and center at E3. If, uh, some some people may recall E3 2014, like the bracelets lit up like in sync with the trailer that we did. Wow. And it went from being this small game to like actually being quite a feature on the on the on the E3 presentation, which really gave us a big, big lift and put us kind of into the spotlight more than even we could have expected. At one point, apparently, uh, we were going to open the show instead of Call of Duty, but then Call of Duty were like, here's some money. Um, so, uh, but it would have been pretty cool to open up uh, Microsoft show, but it, it was memorable regardless. And I think that was a big moment for the studio because it's like, okay, now we're, we're arrived. And I'm glad that we were able to follow through on what we presented at E3. And actually that carried over to the entire game. It wasn't just like a little snippet. Yeah. You mentioned an, an ensemble. Mm-hmm. What was that comprised of for the first game? So uh, we had two or we had two lineups for Ori One. About seventy percent of the game is scored with just a chamber group, so like twenty strings and a single woodwind, piano and harp. And then for the bigger segments, basically the the chase sequences and a few of the cutscenes, uh, we had forty strings, uh, brass section, but with no trumpets um, and uh, double woodwind. And piano and harp so still not like the biggest group especially because nashville that room can't take like a huge number of musicians but like actually the small sound perfectly fit that room is that an ocean way yeah ocean way um it perfectly fit that room and thus like sounded really like unique for the for the score that we were trying to create or he's like super young and childlike in the first game and I think the intimacy of having a smaller group brings you a little bit closer to him. Now, in the second game, it's much more grown up, seen and already done a whole bunch of stuff in the first game. And so we wanted something that was a little bit more. It, it's not just it's literally not just the case. We had more money, therefore we could go to London and record it. It was actually it actually was a music design decision to make the score bigger. Yes, it did help that we had more budget, sure. um, but it would have been bigger and recorded somewhere it would still it would have always be felt bigger because the the story was more mature but like in the first game sure it served the narrative i i view the two soundtracks as one complete like whole thing there's there's people like which soundtrack is better or one or two because that's what the fans do but to me it's like all just one big piece of long form music and it was always composed that way sure the second score is like an evolution of the first one yes exactly i guess for the benefit of people watching this who are curious about getting into games uh, let's say there's a composer or maybe even you know a singer songwriter just someone who doesn't know that world um, they've never worked on games and they want to break in what would you say like how would they do that oh it's it's so different now because like when i you know it has changed i can go i can say go on to mod db and create a profile and you just never know because that's what i did um i think i think the <sighs> The one piece of advice that I think is timeless is finishing your work and getting it up there because like it's like I, I think when you're starting out, you're so precious and wanting to create, you're like, everything must be a masterpiece. Um, actually, no. <laughs> Just write a melody and keep it simple. And actually that's the thing that'll probably get you 
get you noticed. Um, I think another easy trap to fall into is like, I'm going to I'm gonna write a piece just like Hans Zimmer, or I'm going to write a piece just like Gordy Hub, or I'm going to write a piece just... No, no, you're not, because you're just going to sound like a worse version of them. Just writing more music allows you to be able to develop your own voice, whatever that is. It's like, yes, it's okay to like try and copy someone else's style, but I wouldn't ever publish that. Just try and do lots of different things, create your own tracks, and then put them out there. There's no excuse in modern media music, in my opinion, to not be writing music at any point because there is always somewhere where you can sell it. Now, you you know, you might feel that like you're, I'm above selling royalty-free music. Well, I wasn't, and it paid my bills for like good three to four years. I sold tracks on Audio Jungle for like several years. And wow. did I feel great about selling tracks for $16 a pop? Well, no, not initially, but when that track sells 3,000 times, it's like, you know, right. that, that's yeah. pretty nice. Uh, now, that doesn't happen with every single track. But again, you only need one track to take off. And like, oh, that one track paid my rent for like two years. You just never know. And that's why I say like there's never any excuse to be writing. At the time in like 2010, when I didn't really have much work, I'd buy a new sample library. I remember um, there was some drum library. And I just literally created like five epic drum tracks. Um, didn't take me long. It was actually just an exercise for me to learn the library. But then I put all those tracks online and made a decent amount of money from them. And you're just trying to do enough to, to survive, but also doing it like keeping the, the muscle of writing music active. Yeah. The 1,000 hours or whatever it is, or the 10,000 hours of, of doing the thing before you can actually get really good at it, I, I believe it's incredibly true, especially for people in a creative field. And unfortunately, there's no shortcut to it because uh, if there was, we'd all be taking it. So right. it's it's not the most innovative advice, but writing more music is honestly the quickest way to like getting better It's and, and not being precious about it, I think. Yeah, I, I wish I had gotten more into production music back in the day earlier in my career because uh, for me, it was just games and that was it. It's all I wanted to do. And and now my advice to composers getting started is diversify, like just yep. do it all because multiple revenue streams is really the key. And like you said, it just, it improves your chops as well. And, and uh, how quickly you can turn things around writing to a brief. And you just never know how one thing is going to lead into another. Yeah. You could get a gig from production music that ends up being in games. You, you just don't know because people move around all the time, but they remember who they worked with. Yeah. I wonder if things have changed as far as getting into the industry itself from like a business and networking stance, uh, partly because of the pandemic, obviously. But, you know, like before then, it was just GDC, the Game Developers Conference every year and going to sessions, more so parties afterwards and talking to people. How has it changed, I guess, since the pandemic? I think now it's 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 pretty difficult because we're still in that weird phase where like people are might be going to events, but they might not be. Yeah. I think it's more important than ever to like have a base online. And, you know, I, I think um, I think some people like to have profiles everywhere, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. I, I can't even keep up anymore. I'm feeling old these <laughs> days and I feel like I've barely started. Um, but I think if you're going to have an online platform, you've got to kind of commit to one of them and make sure that it's really good. It doesn't really yeah. matter which one it is, but like committing to it so that people can easily find you, whether it's a website and Twitter or whether it's a website and Instagram or something else. You've got to you've got to be on it regularly. My thing is Twitter. I, I quite like using it because it's a good way to interact with a lot of people very quickly. And you don't have to feel bad about leaving short messages because that's literally what the platform is designed for. Until Elon changes it. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's, yeah. Um, uh, so... I think I still maintain that in-person contact is extremely valuable, but I do think people will make their initial connections online now and then try to follow up in person. Yeah. I've gotten two gigs recently where I I literally was asked to pitch online and the I mean they're two really very large scale gigs and even even the pitch was was very limited it seemed like they wanted me from the beginning but I I feel like you don't really know if you want to work with someone until you've actually met them at least at least once even if it's just a courtesy meeting and I think I still think even in the post pandemic era humans still value the face to face contact even if we might never actually be in the same room for the rest of development i still think it counts for more if you can feel this is going to sound kind of like hippy dippy but like feel the energy of the other person yeah no totally makes sense i think that just goes an incredibly long way that's not to say you can't get a gig online only you absolutely can and there's like i'm sure there's like hundreds of examples but i think for lasting relationships if you do get a gig online you should make a point of 
actually meeting that person in real life at some point during the development, it'll actually cement that relationship. Mm -hmm. That's like the only thing I could really recommend. I'd still recommend going to all the conferences because you just never know. Yeah. But if you're going to the conferences, you've kind of got to have something ready online to point people towards. And I think the age of handing out business cards, I mean, like it's 2023, <laughs> man. I, you know, I'm not going to look at this, you know, give me a flash drive or like send it, send me an email. So you could literally send me an email right now with a link to your reel. And right. I there's, there's literally a greater chance that I will probably listen to it. Because as you can imagine, I get sent reels all the time. I'm sure you do too. Right. Yeah. But yeah, if it ends up... It, to me in a more direct way, I'm more inclined to, to, to look at it. So yeah, it's a little bit trickier these days, but I still think fundamentally the combo of human interaction online, be it being online will be at least a good pathway to getting started. And just looking like you're being active in the industry, even if you're not <laughs> giving the illusion that you're being active, um, just by being at the conference, like people will assume that you're working. Sure, That's, yeah. that's, just, that's just how it is, um, that's just how humans are. So yeah, go even if you can. I know it's really expensive, especially, especially now, it's like San Francisco is obnoxiously expensive. Um, but you don't have to go to GDC. There's South by Southwest, there's PAX, there's E3, there's- Game SoundCon. Yes, exactly. There's, there's like tons of different events. And, yeah, there's a lot. And actually, I think it's really helpful to also meet other people who are also starting out because it's kind of fun to come up together and you might work on each other's stuff, helping other people out. That's certainly how I like started out. Like my friends who I went to USC with, they would conduct for me. They would help me with orchestration. They would help me with printing out the parts and taping them yeah. when I couldn't afford to hire a professional prep company to do it. You just never know when that group of friends can like help you out and you can help each other out and you kind of move up together. Yeah, totally. That was actually good advice. That was the advice I should have started with. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad we didn't bring business cards to Game Sound Con. So <laughs> we were modern. We were just like, sorry, we don't have the cards. I feel like I have to mention, um, not to plug Real Crafter, but we have a QR code feature now where you can generate a QR code from a share link. So you can just have that on your phone. People can scan it. I, I actually used it for a project that just got announced at the Game Awards. It's called Wayfinder. I'm working with Digital Extremes and uh, um, Airship Syndicate, who I've worked with on Darksiders Genesis and The Ruined King. And so this is like an uh, action MMO game. And the team, the team wanted to share the music internally, and I just dropped the QR code in the in the Slack chat. It was super nice. And then there were people, there were other people at the Game Awards, not at the Game Awards, we had like a dinner before the Game Awards. Like, oh, can we hear the music? And I was like, I brought up the QR code again. It was awesome. So that's super cool. Nice feature. There you go. Look at that. Look at that plugging. <laughs> Subtle <laughs> plug. I had to I had to fit it in there. It's all good. Um, still on the topic of composing for games. And again, obviously, for the benefit of people watching, since I work in this industry as well, um, technical skills, or even just like writing to picture and then shifting to games, obviously, there's a lot of differences involved. What would someone need to know as far as like how to write for games, how to prep their music for delivery and things like that? I think, you know, obviously, you've, you, you know, the biggest difference is the linear versus non-linear part. I think that's fairly easy to get your head around now. Sure. Especially because of how common production music is. I think there's actually quite a lot of overlap and it's a dangerous overlap, in my opinion, between production music and producing music for games. A lot of game developers want their music to be able to be split up into a thousand different stems so it can be reconstructed. So you should be able to know how to deliver your music like that, you know, make it loopable, give it lots of edit points and, and all of that stuff. Um, if you've followed my personal discourse over the years, uh, I've been pretty vocal that I'm not a huge fan of that. I would rather score things horizontally, but of course people don't want to do that because it's more expensive and they don't want to pay by the minute. Um, so, right. but that's just me. I usually get what I want these days because I deliver, but of course it puts me on pressure on, on me. Uh, Cause it's like, well, we're paying you for more minutes. So can you make those minutes good? I'm like, yes, that's what I asked for. <laughs> so I think the most important thing is if you don't have the technical knowledge to like get into wise, and that's totally fine if you don't, um, you need to have someone, whether it's on the team or on your own team that can do that for you and that can advocate for you and that can translate your music into the game the way you want it to, to be. So by extension of that, coming from film where you'd sit down with the director and you'd spot the film with the director, 
Like, what is that process in games? Because so often you get the list of concept art and the spreadsheet of assets, and it's like, you know, we've all been there. And it's like, come on, we're in, we're in 2023. Give me the damn game. Uh, let me play it. Yeah. I guarantee you I will write better music if I can, like, actually have it in my hands. Oh, 100%. And if you yourself are not a gamer, just ha there's no way you don't have a friend that is a gamer and would love to sign a little NDA and like play it and record it for you. And even if you don't, the QA team that you are working for will have someone that can like record a video for They'll you. They'll play it, exactly. There's, there's literally no excuse for you not being able to see the game in action. And then it starts becoming similar to the, the filmmaking process because you can actually start to see and feel like where your music might play and start to build an idea in your head. Yeah. The way I've always liked to describe it, how I like to work, and it's not how everyone likes to work, but this, this is me because it's worked for me. I always make the architect builder comparison. One can't exist without the other, but they're two very different jobs. And I view myself as the architect. I like want to think about, I'll just use Ori as an example, like every cue placement in Ori uh, was decided by me. I never opened Wise once and I had no desire to. I feel you on that one. I had Guy Whitmore opening Wise for me and he's like the Wise legend. But I would record myself playing the game and I'd annotate every video with like what cue happened where, where it needed to transition. And I'd also double that up with a PDF. So I'd, I'd write up my instructions f as if it was for a programmer so that they could not possibly make a mistake unless I'd written something incorrectly. So even though I don't have the code knowledge, I knew exactly what I wanted to see as the end result, hence the term architect. But then the builder or the implementer is the person like actually putting together the infrastructure in the game. And then as an architect, I go and inspect what the builder has done by playing it and testing what they've done. And, I, and that relationship has worked very well for me because that person, whoever it is, you know, is worrying about all the technical side of things. I'm being hired to write music at the end of the day, but I'm also being hired to make sure that it actually works in the game. Sure. But I feel like there is such an important relationship between the person doing the music and then the person implementing the music. And that can be the composer. There's, there's several examples of composers who do that themselves and good luck to them. I'm very jealous of their skills. It's never gonna be me. But there's also several examples where composers have great relationships with audio impl implementers who you know really understand their work. That to me is the most important aspect of working in games. The biggest comparison in film would be the music editor for sure. Yep. Yeah. If the film picture changes, they're gonna like cut your cues and like reconform them unless you have someone on your music team doing that for you. But they're gonna get it so that it can at least be in sync for the director to continuously review. As I said right at the beginning, this thing is a it's a teamwork. It would be impossible to do it by yourself. There's no composer who is good at everything, um, even though we might like to think we are. So it's just finding someone to help you with the things that you might not be as strong at. And actually, hopefully that person is actually better than you. And in the case of you know, in the case of games, I believe that like implementation connection with the composer is probably more important than ever before. And what that allows me to do is like think about the music in the game and I'm not getting bogged down in like, does this thing loop properly? Right. Do the tracks transition at the right time? I know what I want to happen, um, but then getting it set up is, you know, it's it's me and the person implementing implementing my music. I think there's a danger in being too far removed from that process, like if you're writing cues and handing off stems, whatever, and then you dust your hands off, you're done with it. They can do whatever they want. They can mix it. They can drop certain stems out. And it's a shock because the game launches and a scene plays and it's it's like nothing like you intended. Uh, but you don't always have that ability. In some projects, you don't have that control. Yep. Uh, it's just, it is what it is. And it sounds like you've been fortunate. That's that's happened on a couple of projects in in my case. Um, I kind of I do understand why it happened. I do always think it's a missed opportunity. Yeah. And now, honestly, I think because I've been so vocal about it, I think people who have hired me recently kind of know what they're getting at this point, and they're like. Are you sure you want? I literally get. Are you sure you want to be involved this early? And I'm like, yes. This is literally <laughs> what I've been talking about for years and years. And I can't say what they are, but I'm now getting to do this on AAA projects where it's like, you know, they're they're really massive games. And I'm going to find out if I can walk the walk. I've done it. I've done this for like 20 hour games and 30 hour games. And now I'm going to find out if it's like if it can scale to 50 or 60 or even even 100. Will I be able to do it? I'm pretty confident I will because I've been brought on early enough. But this is the thing that I I feel like when I play games that 
I know the composer has been involved in for a long time. I really feel the identity shine through. One of my favorite games in that respect that is truly AAA uh, is the Horizon Zero Dawn and Horizon Forbidden West. Yeah. And Joris Man has been involved in that with that company for so long. He is he is literally like part of the the DNA there. And you hear 10 seconds of Horizon, you know instantly it hits Horizon. That that doesn't happen overnight. That is sound and a world that was cultivated over years. And the t I bet they had very little temp music because I reckon Yoris started, I don't know this for sure, I'm completely hypothesizing, but I'm sure like concept tracks were like floating around the game early so that the team could get used to them and so that no one really got attached to any temp music. I think when you're creating a world from scratch, especially, being involved early is as a composer is the most important thing because why wouldn't you want to be involved early? The art team is creating things from scratch. Right. Animation teams creating characters from scratch. Stories being written from scratch. Yeah. Well, sounds a pretty big part of it too. And they're certainly creating ambiences and footsteps and creature sounds from scratch. So why wouldn't a big part of it, the music, also want to be built from the ground up as well? And I, I think some com companies are really starting to cotton on to that. It's just they're probably not used to having music as a pre-production expense rather than tacking it on at the end. It's like, music is post. Well, actually, no, it's not. Uh, e there's even examples of this in film. I mean, look how long... Hans Zimmer was on Dune. Right. He was on that project for a long time. And you can hear 10 seconds of Dune and you kind of know that it sounds like Dune. Um, and that there's several other film projects where you yeah. know that the composer was involved for a long time. And it's like, yeah, this isn't just another orchestral score. This is an orchestral score that clearly had some experimentation time so they could really develop a unique sound. And if you don't have that playtime, that like, you know, music's supposed to be fun, right? And you're supposed to be able to experiment and explore. If you don't have that, yeah, you can still get a professional sounding score, but you're giving yourself less of a chance to forge a unique identity. Wise words. That's, that's <laughs> solid gold. It's true, though. I think I, I heard someone say that, you know, we're not just composers. We're also filmmakers, yep. which kind of sums it up. It's like you are part of that process. And if you are isolated enough, you know, I think the project will suffer for that. Yeah, I, I yeah. There's nothing. There's nothing worse than being being isolated on a project. But sometimes that's the job because there there might have been like a whole load of things where you enter a project that might have happened that you don't even know about. And sometimes they they just want the they just want the music. Please just give me the music so we can just move on to the to the next project. It's been it's been very interesting since I finished since I finished Ori One. I've done some projects where it's clear I am being brought on to just deliver a score as opposed to deliver a vision. It's a great way of putting it. There's two very subtly different things. And I'm fine with both, but I would much prefer the latter, delivering the vision. If I, you know, I could have my choice. I, I like world creating. Stepping into a world that someone else has created is is great because wow, I get to work on this really cool IP. One of the things I'm hopefully looking forward to, it depends on if Microsoft want to make another one. I don't know if I'd work on an Ori 3. And actually I'm genuinely interested to hear what someone else might do with it. Because hmm. right now, I personally feel like I've said everything I need to say. It's like six hours of music. I'm like, it's a decent that's amount. A, that's a lot of music. I have no idea how like John Williams has done nine Star Wars films. Um, but then I'm still working on ARC and I've, I've just delivered seven hours of music for the animated TV show. So it, it does depend. But I'm genuinely curious to see what someone else might do to build on the IP. Um, if, if it ever happens, that that to me is exciting. I, I'm I'm thinking like, what's what's my next Ori going to be or you know what's what's the next thing that I can create from scratch I happen to know what it is because I'm working on it right now but um and that's the kind of thing I've been waiting for but yeah IP creation is 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 very ex exciting to me and that's the great thing about working in games is that I feel like the scope of games is still only getting bigger and bigger and this I think we're about to enter the golden age. Yeah. Like Hollywood went through its golden age and I feel like we're about to enter it in terms of games where we're going to have banger games like every month. And it's, I feel like it might get to the phase where it's almost every couple of weeks. Right now, everything I feel like drops in November and like February and March and then there's a big gap. Yeah. But I feel like it's going to, There's we're getting close to the point where it's just going to be something really great every single month. And especially now that we're coming out of the pandemic, 2021 and 22 were obviously a little bit lighter in terms of great games. Obviously, there were still were great games released. But looking at 2023 already, it is absolutely stacked this year. You know, we just had Dead Space Remake come out. Uh, oh, there's that 
new game that came out on Xbox Game Pass a couple of weeks ago that has like a 90 Metacritic Hi-Fi Rush or something. Um, and that looks that looks unbelievable and no one even knew about it. Um, it was just a shadow drop. There's just tons of games that we don't even know about. Then there's the ones we do know about. And that's just 2023. And I know it's only going to get better. Yeah. I feel very fortunate to have like entered the industry when I did because... I look at stuff I'm working on and I think it's incredible. And I look at the stuff that other people are working on, like, man, I wish I was working on that, but that person's probably going to do a great job. So whatever. <laughs> and I'll just enjoy playing it. Right. And yeah, it's just kind of cool to see the the breadth of games that are being made right now. I feel like the writing is, is getting sharper too. Like, I'm not sure why it just feels like the writing is so much tighter. Like I played, uh, my backlog is crazy. I have games from like 2017 still. Uh, but I played Control recently. Oh, so good. Incredible. I'm just like, this is like a, a TV show. Yeah, it's it's one of those few games where you actually want to hear every audio log, right? And look at every document. And they, and they do have a lot of like really interesting lore documents. Oh, yeah. A ton of lore. That world is so meticulously crafted. And yeah, games like, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I feel like games like Control are going to drop like every month in a couple of years. It's the first game I thought of when you said that. I'm like, yeah. Control was the last thing I played that was just like, this is next level. And yeah, the writing, I think, is the last thing to, to catch up in games. It is definitely getting better. It's still not universally there and because the writing does have to sync up with the voice acting as well, which is, can still be a, a little bit uneven. And that also, you know, depends on budget and everything like that. But it is definitely getting better and better. Yeah. When I started really thinking about games, which was like 20 years ago, I think how far we've come in 20 years. And I think, my goodness, where are we going to be 20 years from now? Oh, yeah. It's both scary and incredibly exciting. Definitely exciting, especially with VR, this whole other thing that's happening. And yep. That's, that's, <laughs> that's just a baby right now. Yep. It's coming. Um, you know, you were talking about being part of the vision of the project. Related to that, I saw an interview that you did, and you talked about when you were playing a game, like a, a new project and you're analyzing it to develop a sound palette, uh, you said you'd like to think about the non-orchestral instruments first. Why is that? So, so one, of, one of the things about, you know, I, I think the orchestra can be really useful, mm -hmm. but it can also be a bit of a crutch because if you know what you're doing with orchestra, you can make it sound good no matter what. And equally, it's one of the things that we we all kind of know what an orchestra sounds like, especially if we play games, because we, we hear it all the time. And it's just one of the things I like doing is like, how can I make a certain environment just feel different? And I feel like, especially at the beginning of my career, you know, when I didn't have time, energy or budget to make sounds myself or have someone make sounds for me, I felt like the first part of my job was patch hunting. I think we've all done patch hunting. Oh yeah, you can spend hours doing that. Yeah. and. It's funny because I, I actually love that part of the job, but wow, it is time consuming, yeah. especially with the way I like to work. But, you know, I put the video up of myself. It's myself playing the game. And I'm just like constantly trying to find the right thing that I feel matches the visuals. But I feel like if I put that work in, um, if I have the interesting sounds first, then it's very easy for me to layer the orchestra on top. Whereas if I start with the orchestra, it's hard for me to layer stuff in because the orchestra already takes up so much of the, the frequency spectrum. Yeah. I like to choose those sounds first because then it narrows down what I can do with the orchestra afterwards, which means I'm making choices not just on the initial sounds, but I'm also subconsciously making choices on what the orchestra is going to be doing because I know I'm not going to want certain instruments to interfere with the cool sound that I just found or made sure. or whatever. There are some games, obviously, where it's explicitly like, we want orchestra the whole time. Uh, Immortals Phoenix Rising was like a good example of that. It's classic, big, bold Greek mythology. The brief was Greek mythology combined with Disney Fantasia. Like, <laughs> what a fun gig. But that's pretty defined in terms of the, in terms of the palette. Uh, however... There was one part of the game which was kind of set in the game's underworld and they were like, no orchestra for this. Um, and so it ended up just being pads and twinkly stuff and then an aulos, which is a terrible sounding Greek woodwind instrument with two reeds. It's absolutely horrendous sounding <laughs> if you hear it dry. You got add reverb. Yeah, add tons of reverb. Yeah. But also one of the cool things it does is insane pitch bend in real time, just based on the position that the reeds are at in your mouth. If you look at an hour's performance on YouTube, and because it can produce two notes at the same time, you can get dual pitch bend at the same time. But it's being, it's, you know, it's not with a MIDI controller, it's literally with a real wind player. Oh, that's cool. So I had uh, Kristen Nagus, who's, you know, 
the video game woodwind person at this point. She, uh, I, I, I literally bought her an Aulos and I was like, just make some sounds and I'll, uh, you know, I'll figure out how to get them in the game. And that's what made that area feel unique. And I was like, we could add orchestra on top of this, but the Aulos, because it was doing so much in the mix, I was like, no, nah, it doesn't need anything. Everything is everything is there. So, so sometimes I will end up creating like these sounds, and then the track will actually be done, and I don't need the orchestra at all. Mm -hmm. One of the things that games went through, and maybe is still going through a little bit, game developer has some success, gets a lot of money, and like, yeah, let's go to Abbey Road and record everything, and no one is asking why. <laughs> Do we actually need this massive orchestral music? For a game for like a really intimate game yeah i mean if it, if it works for what you're doing then absolutely go for it but like uh I, I actually got asked that on a recent project like when's our big orchestra recording i'm like we you realize we don't actually have big orchestra in like any of the mock-ups <laughs> and i was like where do we go to abbey road right it's like you know i can do it but it's not appropriate for your project and they're like Oh, really? And I'm like, well, yeah, that's just kind of like you you, you had the opportunity to push that direction at the beginning. So, yeah, it, I, I do think there's a, a little bit of that. If you're going to put it in your game, there's there's kind of got to be a reason for it. And then, you know, if you do want to go big, there's certainly the resources to, to go big, um, whether you do it in London, L.A., Vienna or wherever. I feel like Abbey Road has become like a rite of passage for so many people, you know, especially composers. Like I have to record at Abbey before I die. I'm very fortunate to have recorded there. I mean, I've recorded there six times in the last year. So wow. I'm very, yeah, for, for one project, I'm very, very lucky. But yeah, it's it's not truly, you haven't truly recorded Abbey Road until you've got the picture in front of the iconic sign. Um, and then you've got to get the picture on the balcony as well in Studio One. Then then that bucket list thing is complete. Um, so, uh, but no, look, I totally get it because literally, you know, some of the most iconic soundtracks ever have, have been made there. And ultimately, if you are recording big stuff, I think it is the best room in the world to do it in um, especially for, for action music air studios is great for more of the the fantasy stuff if you need something that's a little bit lighter in tone but if you're doing fast and aggressive action music uh the, it's the width of abbey road that is just absolutely insane yeah i just had 20 brass in there and they were just spread out like across the room and it was it is one of the most glorious sounds i've, I've ever heard um and uh, yeah, I totally get why people would, would want to record there. Um, I, I believe I believe Candy Crush Sagas, one of their soundtracks is like recorded at Abbey Road because they have so much money. That That's like a perfect example. It's like, because we can. Sure. Yeah, of course. Because that, that whole game series is literally a bank. Um, so uh, they were probably just, yeah, let's go to Abbey Road and let's record, you know, let's spend three days there and record some whatever Candy Crush music is. But in, in a strange way, composing that kind of light orchestral music, it does actually work if you do it at Abbey Road. So conceptually, I was like, I can still get on board with that because it would almost just about be kind of appropriate it's it's when you have a game which is electronics focused or super fantasy focused without much orchestra in it. it's like yeah we should do the abbey road recording anyway that's like where the, the the disconnect happens music supervisors always make sure that your your uh instrumentation is appropriate for the project no matter how much budget you have um, and how tempting it is to spend it yeah i feel like ocean away has become a very popular decision a uh, destination for people to for recordings uh, in games too. Well, EA, yeah, EA, EA kind of um, is is a big fan of recording there. And Ocean Way in particular, in my opinion, is a fantastic room for strings because you get a lot of control over the sound. That room just really sings with strings and also has a fantastic bass sound. The bass in that room is just super dialed in because it's not such a big room that it gets lost in the room. So if you need something smaller and tighter, which a lot of the action scores are, it's, a, it's like a really, really wonderful sound to... to to, to work in nice punchy room yeah i've recorded there so many times on a lot of different things and it's just it's a reliable room for sure that's awesome i want to shift gears a bit uh and talk about more business related stuff yep specifically agencies um because this comes up a lot people always ask like hey how do i get an agent and people always say they find you you don't bother them they'll come to you and when, when you're ready you are represented by gorfain schwartz when did that happen and how did that come about so that happened in 2016, late 2016, maybe. Uh, I can't remember exactly. Um, but yeah, it was award circuit time and everyone was like, what is this Ori game that's getting nominated and winning a bunch of stuff left, right and center? Because it kind of, I think if you knew what was going on in gaming, then yeah, you were aware of Ori, but it wasn't, it didn't really hit 
the public conscious until it actually came out and it's quite yeah it did review very well but it's quite a word of mouth game and i think people it was when people started seeing the reactions on youtube online like people would play the opening it helped that our opening made a lot of people cry and that's a thing that gets shared oh i cried in the opening 10 minutes of ori you should do this too that, that <laughs> is like the best advertising you could possibly get right and we knew that if people played the prologue, they would probably play the opening, you know, two hours of the game at least, because it's it's a hard game to put down. We make it very easy to not quit. Even though you die a lot, like you respawn really quickly. That is all by design. Um, there's no loading screens. I, I I think actually one of the biggest differences in the game during during that game's development is originally that game was designed as like screen, like an old school 2D game where you like there'd be a screen and then you get to the end of the screen and then it would load the next screen. But now it's all scrolling. That happened with like a year to go. Um, and when we change from screens to no screens at all, like one continuous world, you can imagine that how that affected the music perception as well, because it's oh, like yeah. there's, there's no break. I logged in, it was literally just an overnight update and I logged into um, the SVN and got the latest build and I, I fired it up and I'm like, wait, what? Uh, this has made the game a million times better because now there's no break in immersion. Wow. And this is such an atmospheric game. Can you imagine like having a black loading screen like every, you know, every three minutes? It'd be horrible, horrible for that game. Yeah. And then, yeah, so the no loading screens was a big thing for us. And so um, not breaking that immersion kept people playing. Back to the agency question. I think because of that word of mouth and the game certainly reviewing very well. Um, and I think... We released that game at the right time as well. I feel like if that game had been released a couple of years later, or even a couple of years earlier, it might not have been the right time. But I think the industry was ready for a game like that. And that often, there's, I think there's an element of luck with that for sure, because there are plenty of other similar games that like you know do a similar thing, but maybe don't capture the imagination in quite the same way. All the games industry is in a different spot. Sure. If Journey released in 2018, would it have been as successful? I don't know. It doesn't doesn't matter. It released in 2012. There'd never been anything like it, and you know the rest is history. I don't think at 20. There are a lot of 2D platformers in 2015 and prior to 2015. However, I don't think they blended quite so seamlessly gameplay, cinematic, story, art, animation, all of it into one cohesive whole. I think Ori's individual components are very, very strong. Yeah, definitely. But I think the real strength of the game is how it all coalesces into to one cohesive vision. And I think that's why the game was awarded as much as it was. That got me noticed by, I mean, I literally interviewed with every agency um, and I went with GSA. They, pr they approached you, they reached out to you. Yes, yeah, they, they reached out to me because, you know, who is this guy? Yeah. Because literally, I come 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 from nowhere, and all of a sudden, it's it's literally everywhere. You know, I got to go to the Game Awards. That was a that was a good laugh. Um, uh, I mean, all award shows I find absolutely hilarious for very different reasons. Um, but you know, I I won some awards, I lost some awards. It didn't really matter. Like I was having a great time. But of course, if you're at the shows, then people see you as well, and probably some of the agents were there as well. Um, so yeah, I got approached and. Honestly, the sole reason I, I went with GSA is because I felt I had a good synergy with them. And I, I think they got what I was about and that they really understood what I wanted to do and that they understood games. That's pretty much it. It is it is the same story that like I think you won't get approached until you've done something of note. And of course, that's the whole, that's the old chicken and egg uh, scenario is like, well, to do something of note, you might need an agent. But it's, right. it's, it's, yeah, Ori is like the perfect, perfect example because it's, because it was an indie game that punched well above its weight um, and uh, um, captured the public consciousness, and I think um, I think that's that's why I had a lot of interest after that. So, yeah, there's, I, I've got nothing much new to offer that uh, offer on that front. But you know, if you if you work on enough games, you'll eventually hopefully land on something that is you know an indie project that is of real quality, and you just never know when that one is going to to punch further than expected. Well, it definitely turned a lot of heads for sure. It's, it, it grabs you right away. Uh, first, the 10 minutes to prologue, and then you think it's just a platformer, but it's not because there's a skill tree and all these like, you know, detailed game mechanics that you're not really expecting. And it's just, it's just a pleasant surprise. So 2016, uh, Gorfain, you're still with them, I assume. Mm -hmm. 
things things do change. Yeah. People do change agents. It's it's uh, kind of a, a running joke with the composer world. It, it, it is funny. Like I, I have seen like many people come and go, but um, I am yeah. very loyal. Basically, until until I have a reason to remove someone from my team, I won't remove anyone. Yeah. And they haven't given me a reason yet. And actually, especially recently with these two massive projects, I'm going to be with them for a while. So uh, that's great. Working with an agent. You know, you obviously have to appropriately set your expectations. People come in, they think, well, how come they're not getting me work left and right? You know, how do you work with your agent on a regular basis? And like, what is the biggest value that they bring to you? I think, and I've, I've learned this particularly in the last couple of years, the, the value initially was just looking at my general workload and seeing, understanding what I could manage and, you know, just teaching me what it was to true... I felt like I was professional before I signed with GSA, but since then I now really understand what it is to be professional and, you know, also learning when they can cover for me if something, if something goes wrong, because, you know, real life sometimes gets in the way, right? Yeah. It's just having them cover for me. Then there's, of course, there's the legal and business side of things. And, you know, I think I'm an intelligent guy and I can read paperwork, but the bigger the projects, and I'm sure you've encountered this with, when it gets to corporate level, you get like a 30 page contract for 30 minutes of music. And I'm like, oh my God, I, I, I don't need to read all of this stuff and how much of it is actually relevant. Um, and it become, you know, that becomes a time sink if you're doing it all yourself. And of course, I'm not a legal expert. Right. Being able to lean on them for that. The other nice thing is, uh, you know, having them aggressively chase up invoices. As GSA put it to me, we're here to be your bad guy. <laughs> so you, you can be the good guy all the time. Things don't have to get awkward between you and your client. No. All you do is talk about creative vision and then leave the rest to yeah. the agent. Obviously, they are able to, you know, pitch me to various people. But, you know, I, I think my sound, especially now, is quite specific that I think it's something that you either want or you don't. And I'm OK with that. Uh, I'm OK with being a chameleon, but I think at this point, like you're hiring me for, for a certain thing and also my approach, which is a little bit more holistic because I'm, I'm so involved so early. So I think, you know, while I, while I can pitch for literally anything, I almost prefer not to at this point. There was a phase when GSA had me pitching for a lot of different projects, but now it's more find the project that Gareth will truly care about and you know he will go all in on. And it's not to say that I didn't care about previous projects. It's more like find the project that you feel connected to. Sure. It's just human nature that we're going to feel connected to some projects more than others. Right. But I think that phase in like 2017 and 2018, I think I did five pitches in a row and I lost them all and then I was getting downhearted. But then but then I won like two in a row and one of them was Immortals Phoenix Rising and the other was Halo. That's quite a good back to back to win. That's a big so one. So it's like, yeah, exactly. It's like they 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 come and they come and go um in, in terms of pitching. But now, especially after Will of the Wisps came out, because it was such an expansion on the original. I mean, it has twice the amount of music as Blind Forest and the implementation is is much, much, much tighter than it was in Blind Forest, partially because we didn't use any middleware in Blind Forest. I don't know if you knew that. It's all it's all stock Unity playback in uh, Blind like Forest. Hand, just hand coded in. Oh, hand coded in. Yes, truly. Jeez. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's amazing that it works as well as it does. But no, Will of the Wisps is all done in Wise. And it is, it is a lot tighter experience as a result. And I think that was maybe the turning point where it's like, okay, this is, you know, me executing on a, executing my vision to like a much higher level. And that's kind of like what you get now if you hire me. And people ask me like, aren't you worried about missing out on certain gigs? And I'm, my philosophy, and I, I spoke about this with my agent too, is look, I'm a professional composer. You could hire me and I could probably figure out how to write in any style. Um, I remember talking about this with Gary Scheinman, actually. It's like, we're all pros. A lot of us have done this many times over. And if you hired us to write in a style that we're not familiar with, we could probably figure it out because that's what professionals do, right? But I am at the stage now where it's like, I am okay with people, we, you know, my sound might not be right for you and that's okay. Because equally, I believe that my sound might be very right for certain projects. And that's how I've been talking to developers recently. If they, if I can really feel that they want what it is that I do in terms of my aesthetic and my approach, then that's the person who, you know, I'm, it's like I'm going to be committing to this person for the next three to four years, maybe. Exactly. I want to make sure that, like, there's that affinity there. That's the, And that's really important. So that's that's kind of the the thing that I've been channeling with Gorfain and Schwartz, especially over the last couple of years. And it's been kind of fun to have that direction with them. So it's it's shifted from 
let's pitch Gareth on everything because I was totally up for it. Whereas now it's like a lot more focused and it may go back to like pitching on a bunch of stuff in, you know, five or six years time. But right now I've got some very long-term projects to, to focus on that, you know, if they turn out as I think and hope they will, then they'll open up, you know, a whole bunch more interesting avenues. Yeah. Those are the best projects where they, uh, instead of looking for a composer, they're looking for you. Like they already have pe- people in mind. They're looking for a certain sound and they know it's you yep. and they reach out to you. Those by far are the best. And I, and I feel like there are quite a few composers in the industry who, if, you know, Mick Gordon, you know, you know what you're getting if you hire Mick. Gary yeah. Scheiman, you kind of know what you're getting if you hire Gary. You know, the, the, you could go through, we can go through a whole list of composers. Um, and, you know, we, we also talked earlier about developing your your own sound. Well, it's like those composers have their own sound. You, you, you know what you're getting. And that's a very good place to be because, like, there's not many other people. Like, look, I could try and write a track like Mick, but wow, it my God, it would take me so long to even get 20% to the level of production that he can. I just don't have that knowledge and history and expertise and thousands and thousands of hours of producing music in that style that he does. I could probably get pretty close, but it probably wouldn't hit in quite the same way that his stuff does. Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with being a specialist. You know, some people who are starting out, they think, oh, I have to write in all these styles. You don't have to. If you want to, you can, but you don't have to. And I think it's better to really specialize and find your voice and do what you do best. And then that's what you're known for. Yeah, at, at different phases of your career, you know, because because you said at the beginning, it's important to diversify. And that I think is definitely true. But in the process of diversification, you will probably find your unique voice. I think that's probably where you and I have come to the conclusion on on, the, on that front. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, you should still diversify your revenue streams. Uh, yes, and the revenue streams. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, but your style, yeah, it just... I think with a lot of composers, you eventually discover who you are and what your sound is. It just, uh, it takes time. Yeah. You brought up Halo. That's obviously a, a big one. What was it like? I mean, that's got to be kind of daunting in a way, coming onto this huge franchise. Um, how did that opportunity come about? And what was that like? Halo is an interesting one because it was also took place pre and during pandemic. Um, so uh, all kinds of things going on. I started working on Halo in 2019 which in retrospect probably wasn't the smartest thing because I was also shipping Darksiders Genesis in winter 2019 and shipping Ori 2 in spring 2020. Jeez. But it's Halo. Can't can't turn it down, right? Right, right, right. Especially once you're offered it. The thing about working on Halo that was tough, and I've kind of hinted at this already, is stepping into a musical language that someone else has created, uh, Marty, Michael, all of the other composers who have worked on on Halo. And I I remember my first few tracks, they were just so overwritten because I was trying too hard to impress. And I was like, okay, I have to go back to school and I just have to go back and play the original games and study the original scores and find out what makes these scores work. And once I did that, I was like, oh man, I could have saved myself a whole bunch of time and energy if I'd done this before I started doing my concept tracks. And I think the thing about Halo that I noticed the most is even though it's an action game, the score has a lot of space. And I'm not talking about like sci-fi space, it just has a lot of space in the mix Mm -hmm. because it's so rhythmic and the gaps between the rhythms make it feel, you know, even, even though there's not much happening in those gaps, because they are gaps, they add kind of a propulsion because when the next hit happens, you feel it more because it's not just a constant drone of drums. Yeah. The rhythmic choices in the original Halo scores uh, are kind of what defines them to me. Like everyone will think about the Gregorian chant um, and the famous da 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 yeah. It's actually the whole score is very interesting rhythmically. And once I like figured that out, I was like, okay, now I, you know, now I kind of have the direction I need to go in. Um, about 70 to 80% of my work on the score was take, you know, taking a look at Halo, particularly Halo 1, 2, and 3, and you know, trying to produce more music in that style. It was only towards the end of the game where there's a new antagonist that kind of enters the fray that it was like, I could really go and do my own thing. Working on this score was like a mix of 
existing in someone else's musical language. And then right at the end of the game, I was able to contribute, like kind of just put my own little little stamp on it, which uh, was, was kind of satisfying at the end. But basically the last level is pretty much all my music right. and it's tied to the new antagonist in the in the game. There's a few of the riffs from Halo 1, 2, and 3 in there, but like the sound world and palette, that's where I kind of got to do my thing. So yeah, it was it was definitely an interesting one. And especially when it came to recording. So December 2019, we recorded the first batch of Halo music no social distancing, pandemic hadn't started. And then the next recording was like a year, a year later and strings were spread out six feet apart in the studio. Brass had to be recorded six feet, six feet apart and breaks had to be longer because they didn't you know, want people in the same room the whole time because brass players obviously can't wear masks. And right. it is testament to the engineers that it sounds as good as it does because they, it, clearly they weren't twiddling their thumbs during the pandemic. They were like, well, we're going to have to come get back into business and we need to be ready when things reopen. Sure. And they really figured out a pretty decent seating arrangement that could get, you know, get things sounding as good as you possibly could. Um, and yeah, I think in terms of the production quality, you don't really know that half over half the score, half the Halo Infinite score was recorded during the pandemic. Um, only a real expert and someone with really good ears would be able to tell the difference. Um I also had this on the animated series that I'm doing for, for Arc Survival Evolved. We recorded the first five episodes under pandemic conditions, and then the last eight episodes in non-pandemic conditions. And only if you listen really closely, the episodes that weren't recorded under pandemic conditions, they just are slightly more focused and more defined because the musicians are packed much more closely together like they would traditionally be in an orchestral setting, whereas they were all kind of spread out around the studio under under socially distanced conditions. But it was truly fascinating to see how engineers made it work regardless because as the saying goes in the entertainment, the show must go on. That's pretty amazing that they, uh, they adapted so quickly right in the midst of the pandemic and, and got that recorded. I, f I feel like it's because they had nothing else to do, you know? It's like, because we were just sitting at <laughs> yeah. home, they were like, well, let's try and figure out like a really good recording technique. And, and at a lot of these big studios, the engineers, you know, share advice. And I think particularly during the pandemic, advice sharing and, and setup sharing was, was particularly prevalent because, you know, everyone wanted to just survive and music was hit particularly hard during the pandemic yep. um so they were like let's you know let's get this up and running as quickly as possible so if someone found a good setup that worked they were all over it and actually i would argue that having the choir spread out for for halo led to a super ambient sound that actually really worked well for the game maybe better i think we it may have ended up being a better aesthetic choice than actually recording choir traditionally interesting i mean we'll never know because but more of a sense of space Exactly. We'll never know because we'll never truly be able to AB everything. But all we know is that it works and that's all that matters. Yeah. I, I guess the conclusion is having that setup, it's it's a setup we'd be open to doing again, even if there wasn't pandemic re conditions required, because it was quite a unique sound. And the choir does sound glorious in all of the recordings they did for, for Halo Infinite, for sure. Amazing. I, ha I have to admit, uh, I know nothing about ARC. I left that kind of a <laughs> clean fine. slate, but maybe you can tell me a bit about it. Oh man, where to begin? So uh, yeah, I've been part of ARC since 2015. I mean, 2015 was a great year for me because uh, Ori came out and then three months later, ARC came out in early access. And at the time, I, I, I got asked to pitch for ARC in, honestly, I think it was like the same month that Ori came out. It was either February or March 2015, but I, I finished my work on Ori 1 in like January 20, 2015. So I was just like, this game's going to be good and I'm just waiting for it to come out at this point. Uh, I can't wait. So I had, you know, a couple of months where I thought I was going to be doing nothing. And I got connected with Ark from another contact who I'd worked with on ModDB, just completely independently of my connections on Ori. And he was like, yeah, I got this dinosaur game and uh, yeah, they're looking for a composer and, you know, maybe you could pitch something for it. And my pitch, they basically sent me the first what was going to be the first trailer of the game and they just said write something for this and i wrote what has now become the main theme i just wrote i was like all right this is just epic dinosaurs doing epic stuff and oh there's a person riding a t-rex like how cool is that <laughs> um so i didn't really have any understanding of the game at the time other than it was a survival game and you could control dinosaurs and frankly that was enough i'm sold Right, exactly. Right. right? That's, that's enough for me. And I was like, okay, I just need to write, 
I need to try and write a banging melody and, you know, kind of just make it a rip rollicking ride for this two and a half minutes or however long the trailer is. Obviously, I, you know, the pitch was successful because my melody paired up with the picture very well. And literally the first trailer for Ark Survival Evolved is basically my pitch. Nice. <laughs> and it's like the mock-up version one. It never had any revisions. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's just one of those things that's just like beautifully collided. I think probably one of the reasons that happened is because I was obviously in a very good spot already. I, I was super confident about Ori. I, you, I knew it was going to be successful. I didn't like know how successful it was going to be. I just knew it was going to be received well. So I was in a good spot. I, you know, if they'd asked me for revisions, I'd be like, great, I'll do another one. Um, but that version one ended up became, becoming the main theme, which we've done a million arrangements of now. So it came out in early access. It blew up because it's dinosaurs and survival and it's MMO. And I think much like Ori came out at the right time, yeah. I think Ark also came out at the right time. There wasn't really a game that was doing what Ark was doing. There'd been a couple of others like Rust and there's there's another one whose name I can't remember, but no one had really like put all of these dinosaurs, <laughs> all of these people, and also the building element into the game. So there's a subtle Minecraft element to the game as well because you know you can build your base and you, you can build like you know places where your dinos can hang out and be safe. Then there's the PvP element, but you don't have to do PvP. You can play it on your own server and you can just farm and tame and hunt dinosaurs to your heart's content. You can do anything in the game, really. Yeah. That was my understanding of the game at first. And then the game started to grow and expand over the next two years before it came out into version one. Now, in early access, it was so successful. We're talking millions and millions of sales. And what you have to remember about Ark is, is that at the time, they were self-published. So, you know, they're not handing off like half their profits to the publisher. It's all going to them. That's amazing. So technically, they're indie. Um, it just happens to be an indie game that has now sold, I think it's like 60 million units. Is there a narrative element to the game? Or is it totally open world? Yes, that's, that's exactly what I'm getting to. So ah. the game came out in 2017. Um, and due to the success it had in early access, that's we were able to actually take all the mock-ups and record all of them at Abbey Road. That was my first time at Abbey Road. So from being this early access title that I was like, ah, it's not going to do much, it ended up being like, all right, 90 minutes at Abbey Road. Oh, my God. And then they started planning expansions to expand the lore. And Ark, I don't want to say too much, but... You might see Silly Dinosaur Game initially, but it's actually an incredibly deep science fiction game. Oh, awesome. And the lore of the game, I don't want to say too much because actually it's tied to the animated series uh, where we do a really good job of condensing the lore that is in the open world game, which is you, you need to put in like hundreds of hours to get the full story. The animated series is basically making the story that we'd, we've told in ARC much more manageable to consume. Um, but... Basically, it will do a good job of explaining why all of these disparate creatures are there in one place combined with humans. There's literally a reason for it. And it's so unbelievably cool. And I can't say any more. It's not just like a random sandbox with dinosaurs and dodos and humans and, and all kinds of other things. Which still sounds fun, you know. Yes, and, and science fiction, like we've got sharks with lasers and stuff like that. There is literally, <laughs> there is literally a reason for it all being there. Uh, and the explanation of it is so cool that, you know, I, I'm really excited for people to actually experience that uh, in, in, in the show. You can kind of get a good idea of it in the game, or even if you go to the ARC wiki and read all the lore, but, you know, that's that's for the hardcore of the hardcore. This will kind of bring the arc story to what I hope will be a more mainstream audience, the kind of audience that doesn't have thousands of hours to spend and grind away in an open world MMO. So, yes, arc does have a story. And the, the goal of the animated series is to tell it in a much more manageable way. So from that early access title where we just had like 10 tracks on release, I think we have like 30 tracks in the full game. Then... There's the Scorched Earth expansion, the Aberration expansion, and all of these have about an hour to 90 minutes of music, the Extinction expansion, Genesis 1 expansion, Genesis 2 expansion, Arc 2 is coming, the animated series with seven hours of music. It's a ton of content. I could never in a million years have imagined that it would be spawned from an early access title <laughs> And it has given me some of my like best recording experiences ever. Obviously, Ori 2 is right up there because I recorded that at Lindhurst in London. But we've recorded all of the ARC music, 
apart from one expansion pack which came out like during the pandemic, we've recorded all of it at Abbey Road uh, with actually almost all the same players as well um, on on every on every session. Wow. And as a body of work, especially especially the recent content, because I feel like I actually know what I'm doing now, uh, I'm I'm like quite proud of it as a body of work. Um, I don't, you know, Ark, the game might never be critically acclaimed, but at the end of the day, millions and millions of people have played it. And if you go onto the Steam charts, it's still regularly like in the top 10. And I think, especially as it's a paid game, not a free game, to see it still up there competing with games that are free in terms of like number of people playing it literally right now. I think that's super cool, especially when it's like eight years later. That is awesome. Yeah, it's kind of been a real gift because I've got to write so many different kinds of music. It's not just hours and hours of dinosaur music. Like we we tiptoed into sci-fi. Right. And the great thing about the show is I've been able to like take my themes that I've written for the game and now put them entirely in a narrative context and create quieter non-combat music versions of them and make even though arc might be a game about monsters and dinosaurs and creatures and, and all of that stuff the show itself is very much a character driven drama that happens to be set in this crazy crazy world that is arc um, and so that's been really kind of fun to do what I think is one of the things that I do best, which is soft and emotive music, but actually do it in the context of ARC because it was the one thing that was missing in terms of ARC's music discography is softer, more ambient music because most of it's like, oh, I'm fighting a dinosaur, let's hear the banging orchestra. Right. But yeah, the, the show has allowed me to stretch the you know the emotional or what what most people will say is my Ori stuff and put that into, you know, put that into arc. Um, so yeah, it, I, I, I've lost track of how many cues I've done for the game at this point, but the fact is I still enjoy it. And cause, cause it's such, it's such, it's such a cool story that I can't wait for people to experience when the, the animation comes out. And I think pe people ask me like, how do you, how are you able to keep writing so much music for arc? And I'm like, because, I love the world that it's set in and the story is really cool. Yeah. I'm looking forward to having people experience that late this year. I'm curious about that ad adaptation. Um, like, I'm not sure what details you can give us, but like who picked up the series and like the discussion of having you continue writing music, uh, you know, like bringing you from the game over to the, the animated series. How did that whole transition work out? So I can't say who has picked it up yet it's going to be announced soon right but jeremy the boss was like i want to make an animated tv series and i'm the boss so i can i mean that's that's pretty much like that's honestly and you so know, the when, same studio it's the same studio who yes did yeah the, yeah wow that's cool so the, the the studio doing the actual animation is a professional animation studio they've worked on um probably the most prominent thing they've worked on is batman the animated series um which is pretty good oh, yeah. so they're now they they have now been working on this um so the you know the, it's not just like a brand new studio that was set up just to do arc stuff they they do have like pedigree sure but jeremy is like no gareth's doing music and because you know because it's his ip he can he basically calls the shots <laughs> jeremy's plan for that was he wanted there to be the natural synergy between the game and the TV show. That's not to say another composer couldn't have done that, because I'm sure they could. It's, you know, it goes back to what I said earlier about, hey, we're professionals, we can we can do anything. But why why would you hire another person when you when I'm literally right here? Right. And it comes back to that old adage of like, oh, game composers can't score TV or film, which is like the most stupidest thing I've ever heard. Don't even get me started. <laughs> it's it's just beyond <laughs> stupid. Um, so. Um, Jeremy was like, no, you're, you're going to do the TV show. It's going to be a lot of work, but uh, you know, I know you can do it because you've done a bunch of cutscenes for the game and this is just a longer version of that. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, I can, no problem. And then I like started to think about how much work it was going to be. And it's animation. It's basically wall to wall. And Ark's music is not subtle and Jeremy does not like subtle music. So um, we've described it as almost operatic in scope. Uh, and I think you could genuinely listen to the score from start to finish and kind of, it will tell a story from episode one, Q1 to episode 14, uh, Q14. Um, so, and the 160 Qs in between. Um, so, um, it's it's definitely not subtle, but then nothing much about arc is subtle. Seems that way. Yeah, Jeremy was like, "Yeah, you're you're going to do the music, and it's going to have that natural connection to the show because 
your orchestration style is going to carry over from the, the game to the show. Some of the melodies are going to carry over from the game to the show. We have lifted a couple of cues straight from the game into the show, which is going to be really fun for our fans to hear. There's, it's not, it's not, doesn't happen that often. That's super cool. It's just ni- a nice like Easter egg to drop. And you know, I have the original stem, so it's literally the exact same. It's not someone trying to copy the cue from the game. It's literally right. the cue with the same stems, <laughs> with the same patches from like 2017, which I'm, wow, I'm glad I got good at archiving early in my career. Because <laughs> those uh, patches are long gone now. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he Jeremy was just like, he really wanted to have that connectivity. Um, and, you know, maybe one day there's a film. Maybe one day, maybe one day there's a musical. I don't know. Like, he, I think he just likes the idea of having, like, the connective tissue between the, having the music. And it's not to say that it can't be done, but I'm always like, why didn't The Witcher TV show hire the amazing composers for that did such a good job on Witcher 3? Do they really not think they couldn't have done it? And I get there's like politics and connections and all of that stuff. It just, yeah. it always seems like, a, and, and by the way, the composers who did do the TV show did a really nice job. So it's not, I, I've just never understood why wouldn't you want to go to the source I, on some level, I think we get pigeonholed as, oh, we're game composers. Yep. And therefore that's all they can do, um, which is unfortunate. And we can see, we've seen how powerful it is when there's um, this cohesion between a game and a movie or a TV show, like The Last of Us, for example. Like, exactly. It's perfection because it's the same composer. It's the same themes. It's, it's his signature sound. Yep. Of course, he wasn't a game composer to begin with. Different story there. I mean, he's a movie guy. But still... I think it's really powerful and I hope we see more of that trend in the future. It's the connective tissue that's so important when you're doing tran- transmedia stuff. And I think people will definitely feel that with ARC because ARC does have a unique identity and uh, we don't we don't want it to sound like anything else. And I'm sure there will be people who don't like the direct how direct the music is, is in the show, but we're banking that that's probably going to be less than two or 3% and that the rest of the people will like how direct it is, especially because it's kind of a style of scoring that hasn't really been done since like you know the 80s or 90s obviously there's still like there's still outliers where there's some very direct music in certain shows but generally speaking music's gotten less direct in tv i think especially in the last 10 to 15 years and yeah this is definitely quite old school in terms of its approach and it's gonna be fun to see if people like it or not i think they will uh but i would say that because i wrote it so (laughs) but yeah it's not like i'm the only person deciding the vision is you know jeremy was on board and the animation studio was on board however i will say that when i submitted my draft for the pilot to the animation studio i think it took them aback because i think they were expecting something a little bit more sparse and that was a kind of an education for them. It was like, no, this is what ARC is, and this is the identity. And yeah. then they like came around and uh, was like, okay, we're making that kind of show. And I think that meant that they could then exaggerate things on the animation side because, okay, well, we're pushing music to that kind of like extreme, or well, we can push the animation to that extreme too. Yeah, it's kind of like one of those things where it worked hand in hand. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how people respond to ARC because, uh, you know, I have literally written every cue that's ever existed for the game um and i've been able to expand on it now for the animated series so i'm i have to admit i'm kind of excited to drop seven hours of music and we're probably going to do what quite a few other series are doing and dropping one album per episode as well as like the compilation album so should help my spotify plays a little bit yeah quite a bit (laughs) is there anything else you can talk about like upcoming projects that's pretty much uh the arc animated series Arc Animated Series is the one that's imminent. The other stuff is much more longer term. I have a couple of smaller indie games that haven't been announced yet that are also coming out in like the next 12 months. Um, yeah, it's, it is building more though to what's happening in 2025 and 2026. That's, I've got two, two projects that are coming and they'll probably be delayed. So it might even be longer than that. But that's the kind of thing that I've, I've mentioned on this call where I've been coming in to build something from the ground up with a team from scratch and uh, just build two very, very different worlds musically. Um, I'm so excited for those projects because it's the kind of, because it is literally the thing that I've been asking to do for so long. And yeah, it's gonna be a while before people see them, but all I'll say is uh, they're, they're letting me do on these projects at a much larger scale, exactly what I was given the chance to do on Ori. Um, and I think, I hope <laughs> that I will be able to, to do what I did on Ori for these games on a much bigger scale. Look forward to hearing it. 
Cool. I think that's uh, that covers everything. We we went way over on time, but that's just I had a great time talking to you. That's fine. I, I well, I, it it is. Yeah. So hopefully, it means that you enjoy talking to me. So uh, yeah. yes, I could have a dozen more questions, but uh, I think we'll wrap it up here. Yep. So anyone watching, if you are interested in learning more about Gareth Coker, you can go to his website gareth-coker.net. Uh, follow him on Twitter and other social media platforms. Uh, appreciate your time today. It's been a blast talking to you, Gareth. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. Take it easy.